Melissa. All right. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody can hear me upstairs, downstairs. Yes. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Tapasvi and all of the staff of the Pune and E course for putting on a wonderful study or a wonderful uh, course. Uh, it's really hard to get this coordinated and synchronized, and it, the amount of work behind the scenes is just enormous. So I wanted to congratulate everybody. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to talk about knee arthroplasty in uh, sessions of sports medicine today. Watching uh, all the lectures today, I almost want to be a sports surgeon, but I just don't think I have the talent as Dr. Olivier had in that last surgery. It was just wonderful. So I'm going to, guys, I'm going to take you through uh, knee arthroplasty, kind of the basics, why I am part of the Miller Orthopedic Review course, so I do residency teaching, and so this is one of the core lectures which uh, I'm going to uh, present to you today. So what I'm going to do is take you through what I do mentally uh, preparing for every single knee replacement surgery that I do. These are my disclosures, nothing related to the balance of the knee today. So this is the core lectures I usually talk about. Today we'll talk about technique and perioperative management a little bit. Tomorrow we'll talk about uh, patella tracking and uh, periprosthetic infection. So for total knee arthroplasty in the last two decades, we've talked about what's a successful total knee. Mel Ritter and others, numerous lectures have talked about this. The goals are for best survival long term, and I'm not talking seven, eight years, we're talking 20 years, neutral mechanical alignment, balanced knee ligaments, uh, restore joint line, and a normal Q angle. Okay. So going through start to finish, it's very important with preoperative planning. So what is the definition of a neutral mechanical alignment? Is hip center to knee center to ankle center? And we use intermedullary guides for the femur. We use intermedullary and extramedullary guides for the tibia, or both are okay. What's the reason for doing this? You want to provide even load distribution to the prosthetic joint surfaces so that the medial and lateral sides wear just as well. Polyethylene is very sensitive to wear, and we want to make sure we have a good alignment. So in this technique for total knee replacement, the sequence, we look for preoperative planning, focus on their end bone cuts, go to coronal balancing, and then finally, sagittal plane balancing. Preoperatively, well, we, like, we want standing x-rays, large cassettes, not small ones, 14 by 17 inch cassettes, extension and flexion laterals, sunrise, which is the merchant view, and a standing full length AP to the ankle, from the hip to the ankle, when there is deformity. And what does our radiographic analysis tell us? We want to look at the end cuts of the femur. We want to identify the bone defects. So if we need augmentation, we need to call those systems in. We need to anticipate the ligament releases. Want to assess patella tracking and see what we need to do to correct that. And then look for anticipated constraint needed for the reconstruction. Either no constraint at all, a uh, posture stabilized post for anterior posterior stability, uh, a high post, and in some extreme conditions, even a salvage hinge in some of these post polio or other destructive cases of uh, traumatic dislocation. When we look at the weight bearing views, uh, I think that's the most important thing of what we look at. We want to identify joint subluxation, identify ligament stretch out where we need to uh, correct, and this also helps assess us for it, identify for the, the need of constraint, okay? So here's a standing AP view. You can see that the proximal tibia angle is increased. He has a thrust gait. So on his clinical exam, it's always good to watch these uh, patients walk. If you have a thrust gait and every, the lateral ligaments are stretched out, what you need to do is standing single leg studies. And you can see in this particular case, the joint line uh, or the lateral compartment space is very stretched out. That tells you that I'm going to bring to the table not only my primary knee system, but a revision constrained system. So if I had just brought up my primary knee and I made my cuts, I would have had an unstable knee and I would have been in a problematic uh, situation. We also like full length limb x-rays when we have long bone deformities of uh, the femur, bowing deformities, fractures, corrective osteotomies, and also patients who are very long uh, bones, uh, tall stature or short stature. 
So this is the sequence that I will do mentally and also will draw out tomorrow when we show on Sunday uh, the preoperative planning for a knee replacement or for an osteotomy. It's the same uh, critical technique where we define the axes, okay? So the anatomic axis of the femur is a line that bisects the medullary canal of the femur. It determines the entry point of the femoral medullary guide. So imagine the medullary canal and you're gonna put a guide rod up from the knee. So the first thing you do is you draw the line. Where does the line come out? Usually at the middle of the knee. Sometimes, however, it comes out over on the medial side of the knee, and then sometimes it comes out lateral. So right off the bat, I'm gonna look at my entry point and see where I need to go. And I do this preoperatively, so I know that I'm gonna to have to go to the medial side if I need to. The next step is on the femur is the mechanical axis of the femur, which is aligned from the center of the femur to the center of the femoral head. So if you define your entry point as your center, so you dial from the uh, distal entry point to the distal femoral, or to the proximal femoral head center, this is what it looks like. You go from your entry point all the way up to your center of head. You draw the circles, identify the uh, center of rotation. This is the mechanical axis of the femur. And what you want is to make a cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Why do you want perpendicular to the mechanical axis? You want even loading on the polyethylene so you don't have any shear forces. So after that, the next step is determining the angle between the anatomic axis and the mechanical axis of the femur. So you have an intermedullary rod in the femur which defines the anatomic axis. You select the cut angle and that's the critical surgical decision on the femoral side. You dial in that number. So the distal femur is cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur. So this is how it looks like. You've put your entry site hole distally, you've chosen it, you've put the rod all the way up onto the femur, you've already now preoperatively selected that angle and you measure that on your full length x-ray and this is what we call the valgus cut angle. So after this, if this is for example a five degree valgus cut angle, you, or six degrees or seven degrees, you uh, select in your jig, and in this case, it's a six degree cut angle. The medullary rod is already in the canal. You cut, make that distal femoral cut. You have an alignment checker. You can do it robotically. You can do it with navigation. You can do it just with a, a valgus check guide like this and make sure you're flush, and that's your distal femoral cut. Next step is, uh, and I always want to say, uh, with your preoperative planning is always be careful to make sure you measure your valgus cut angle carefully and somebody who is very tall or very uh, short. And the reason for that is this. If you look at the femoral offset, the offsets are relatively constant. So somebody who is very tall and everybody says that the, uh, the valgus cut angle is five to seven degrees, just dial somewhere between five and seven degrees, you're okay. Not true if you have somebody who is very tall it's over 80 centimeters, the, the valgus or the offset is relatively constant. And so if you have somebody that's really, really, really tall and you dial in a valgus cut angle of seven degrees, the leg is going to be pointing towards Kolkata. I mean, in, in those cases, somebody who is very tall, I will be using valgus cut angles of two degrees. And then sometimes even one person, it was even one degree. But you've got to measure that on, on a full length x-ray. Conversely, if somebody's very short, that's uh, uh, less than 65 centimeters, and you cut a valgus cut angle of five degrees, it's gonna look like a bow. Those patients have a valgus cut angle that's may maybe eight degrees. I've done nine degrees and I've done 10 degrees. And if you have somebody that's very short that is 60 centimeters, you'll see a valgus cut angle that's nine degrees, 10 degrees, quite common. So that's why that full length x-ray is most important on the tall and on the short. If you want to not get a full length in somebody that looks normal and it's a normal height, sure, you're gonna get away with it, but you're not gonna get away with it when somebody's tall or short or you have a bowing deformity. But it's the valgus cut angle that's gonna determine the mechanical alignment on your femur. Okay, so we move, once you've done the distal bone cut on the femur, then you look at the tibia. Same preoperative planning, the anatomic axis is a line that bisects the medullary canal of the tibia. It determines the entry point when using a tibial medullary guide. And yes, there are some people that still use a medullary guide for the tibia. I do not for the reason being is that there are a lot of deformities uh, in Central America and South America where they have bows and you cannot fit the rod all the way down to the angle. 
uh, to the ankle, excuse me. So the anatomic axis is the medullary canal. You draw the line that tells you the entry point in the tibia. Usually that's over the medial third of the tibial tubercle, but sometimes it's over one side or the other because there is offset. The next step is to determine the mechanical axis of the tibia, which is a line from the center of the proximal tibia to the center of, angle, uh, the, center of the ankle. The proximal tibia is used uh, to cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. And why? Because you want even mechanical loading to the prosthetic joint surfaces. So this is what the mechanical axis looks like. You draw a line from the ankle all the way up to the center of the tibia. And again, the concept is cutting perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Why? Because in a prosthesis, you do not want angles and shears because you have an uneven loading. The polyethylene gets overloaded and it can creep. Okay. So how does this look like when you draw it together? So the tibial cut angle is perpendicular to the mechanical axis. So with using an intermedullary guide, you select the, uh, the tibial cut angle. And with an extramedullary guide, what you use to find the, the anatomic axis, mechanical axis, you use the medial third of the tibial tubercle, and you use the center of the ankle. So when using an extra measure guide, you use those two, la those two landmarks, and your jig is set perpendicular, and, and you're all set to go. So that's why most of us use an extra measure jig, and I'll show you why. Most people say that the tibia is a straight tube. That is not true. Sometimes the anatomic axis and the mechanical axis are coincident, probably 20% of the time. However, frequently, they are divergent. In the mid-tibial, you'll have a bow to the valgus side, you'll have a bow to the varus side, and you can't get the medullary guide rod all the way down, so it's somewhat unpredictable. Also, if somebody's got a narrow medullary canal of the tibia, you can't get the rod all the way down. So most of the time, what we use is an extra medullary jig centered over the medial third of the tibial tubercle in the center of the ankle, and then you cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. And that's why most of us have gravitated towards an extra medullary jig or some type of assistance using uh, navigation. Okay, but that's the principle. So if you look at the upper left corner, that's an intramedullary jig. The rod is already down the canal. You set the tibial cut angle just like you did on the femur, or on the bottom left, you will see the extra measure jig centered over the medial third of the tibial tubercle. There's a guide fitting over the ankle, and you center it over the anterior crest. You pin it into position, you make the check. And then on the right, you have a base plate on the top, and you just drop the rod down to make sure that you're parallel to the anatomic or to the anatomic axis of the tibia. And that's what we think about on our preoperative planning for our bone cuts. So this is what it should look like. A mechanical alignment is from the center of hip to the center of the knee to the center of the ankle. And then you go, the next step is to balance the ligaments. Okay. A contrarian technique, and what I want you to know is kinematic alignment. What is kinematic alignment? It's different than the mechanical alignment philosophy. The premise is this kinematic function of the knee is best attained by not disturbing the native knee alignment. And the osteotomy lectures this morning with uh, Dr. Olivier and, and Dr. Craig stressed that, that the, uh, the proximal tibia angle is angled probably about three degrees. Some say 2.8, others say up to four. And I'll show you tomorrow with the patella alignment how that works out. But in kinematic function, the best knee function with kinematic concept is not disturbing the native knee alignment and not adjusting the capsular ligamentous structure. Why do we do that? We, first of all, we accept the knee alignment as is, the implants are positioned as is, the implants are placed without changing perioperative or preoperative alignment, and if the proximal tip isn't varus, you match it up, and this is what sometimes it looks like. This is kinematic alignment, and it, sometimes this line is outside of the knee, and that's the controversial topic. Some say you want that mechanical line somewhere within, centered within a knee, and if you're off a little bit, you have alignment like this. And the question is longevity of the prosthesis. So the advantage of a kinematic alignment, it's kind of like doing a uni compartment replacement, and that's where we gravitated towards this. You put in a uni compartment, 
where you have a correctable deformity. You just put in the parts, you don't touch the ligaments. Patients don't have much pain, they have good function, and they go home early and they're satisfied. Okay, so with kinematic alignment, you put the parts in, don't touch the ligaments. Patients are happy because they have less pain and the function is relatively good. The difference is that cartilage is different than polyethylene. Polyethylene creeps and it slides and you get catastrophic wear. So the concern is with kinematic alignment is long-term survivorship. Survivorship thus far, if you look at the meta-analysis, is no difference at five years, but it takes 10, 12 years to see some of these polyethylenes creep and have subsurface delamination and failure. So we really don't know that answer as of yet, but that's the controversy. So now that you've got your distal bone cuts made, then you work on uh, re uh, removing the rest of the parts or rest of the bone, which is anteriorly, posteriorly, and the camphor cuts. And this is what we call measured resection technique. So measured resection is you replace the bone and cartilage that you cut out with the implants of the same thickness. So this maintains the joint line, it maintains the ligament tension, and this is accomplished with cutting jigs with or without the help of technology assistance. And it's based on this premise, is that the maximum alteration of the joint line of a knee is no more than eight millimeters, some say six millimeters, why? A stable knee that fully bends requires collateral ligament tensioning at the proper time acting coincident with a restored joint line. And if you raise the joint line or you lower the joint line and the posterior axis of rotation doesn't match up, they fire off at different times and then you end up with kinematic conflict. So an altered joint line results in improper timing of the collateral ligament tensioning and that's kinematic conflict. So even though the x-ray looks okay, if the joint line is elevated, the, the ligament function is not gonna be well, doing well. And that is the concept. So we have jigs that we pin in so that when you make that saw cut, what you're actually doing is you're removing cartilage and bone and you're putting and replacing that with metal and plastic of the same thickness. And the only reason to do that is to restore your joint line so that your collateral ligaments work. So once you have your distal bone cuts and you've restored your joint line with your cuts, then it goes to ligament balancing. First step is coronal plane balance, and then the second step is sagittal plane balancing, which is the extension and the flexion gaps. And that becomes a, a little bit harder and more tedious as the deformity gets worse. So we'll focus first on coronal plane balance. The goal here is equal tension of the medial lateral compartment spaces tested in extension. So you go in extension and you test it and you bend it at 90 degrees and you test it and make sure it's all okay. And the technique principle is you tighten up the, the convex side of the deformity which is uh, loose and then the concave side is the deformity that needs the release. And I'll show you this example right here. So this is a varus knee deformity. The convex side is stretched out. The ligaments are loose and stretched out. So you fill this space with plastic and metal so it's tight. Why do we do that? Because you can't tighten a ligament long term. It will always stretch out and we accept that. So if a ligament is stretched out, we fill it up tight. And, that, and the one thing that we can do consistently is to release the tight side. So you fill up the, lo the loose side and you release the tight side. And that's the next basic principle. So release the ligaments to equalize the gap. And you've got to do this in extension and you have to do this in flexion to make sure that the caudal ligaments are functioning correctly. Okay, so varus deformity. The loose, or the loose side is on the lateral side, so you fill up the lateral side with metal and plastic until that ligament complex, including the posterior medial corner, lateral collateral ligaments are tight, and then you do a medial compartment release. So the concave side is the contracted side and you're gonna do the medial release. When I mean medial release, it's a sequence. The varus release in sequence is osteophytes first because they always push those ligaments away. So you remove those osteophytes, then you release the capsule complex next to the joint line. If that's not enough, then you go to the posterior medial corner to bring the tibial out if you need to. And then lastly, you uh, address the superficial medial collateral ligament where you have differential releases. And this is the most key part 
of, of the sequence of releases. So most of the time you can get away by removing the osteophytes. So this is a left knee, this is the medial side. You can see the osteotomes removing all of the osteophytes from the front all the way around to the posterior knee. And then the next step is releasing the medial capsule complex. The capsule to me is one big sleeve. The sports surgeons have differentiated to all these little teeny tiny ligaments, including the thickening of the medial one third of the capsule, which is uh, the deep uh, medial collateral uh, ligament complex. They talk about uh, the uh, uh, meniscal femoral ligament and the uh, meniscal tibial ligament. I see it as a sleeve. And then I just released 1.5 centimeters of that below the tibial joint line, release that as a sleeve, and allow that bone to slide and stretch out. The next part, the next one, is the posterior medial corner. So if you look at the top right, that's the sports surgeon's view. These, all these little teeny tiny ligaments, all these assertions, and all this. The joint surgeon, all we do is make a sleeve. And so the joint surgeon view is we just take a bovie cautery around that and release that. So why do you go to the posterior medial corner? Because it corrects that with a varus deformity, the internal rotation contracture of the tibia. So you make your cuts, you correct uh, the capsule, but you can notice that that tibia is just in and it doesn't want to come out. So you go around that and take that sleeve all the way around to the back of the knee, and I'll show you that on Sunday because I have a, a very significant varus deformity that I have to correct, and you'll see that. So, the posterior medial corner is the capsule semimembranosus with all of those teeny tiny extensions that you see there on the upper right. And we just release that as a sleeve and it creates one continuous sleeve so that you can bring that tibial out. And then lastly, on a varus deformity is the superficial medial collateral ligament, which is the key structure in the last adjustment that you can make in your knee, which is the differential releases, which is very important for the balance of the knee. And what you need to knew, know about the superficial medial collateral ligament as described by Whiteside years ago is that the posterior oblique insertion of that ligament is tight in extension and the anterior insertion is tight in flexion. And it relates to those two different uh, parts. And if you look at Leo Whiteside's original article and that's middle picture is his, his diagrams is that the posterior oblique insertion is tight in extension and what I want you to know, and there's been some confusion in the literature, that the proximal oblique insertion of the superficial medial collateral ligament is contiguous with the posterior oblique ligament, but the posterior oblique insertion is not the posterior oblique ligament. And there is confusion in the literature that you release the POL. That is not true. What you're releasing is the superficial medial collateral ligament at the back. And we call that the posterior oblique insertion site. Okay? Just remember that. So the posterior oblique is tight in, the, uh, in extension. Conversely, you can see the superficial anterior insertion more in front. As Matthew was just showing with his exposures, is that anterior portion is tight in flexion. And if you're going to do your releases, you release the posterior oblique portion of the MCL, not the POL, but that posterior oblique portion of that superficial medial collateral ligament. You do it in flexion. You can do it with an osteotome. You can do it with a bovie cautery. Conversely, you can come underneath the pes anserine and release that anterior insertion release underneath the pes anserine. And that's the differential releases. And when you do your trialing, if the knee in extension is good, but in, in flexion it opens up and it pulls it, then you've got to go back and release that section. Conversely, if you're having problems in fle uh, flexion, is okay, but you bring it into extension and it pulls over into varus, then you do and you release that anterior portion of that insertion site. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay. So we'll go over to the valgus side of the knee, or excuse me, the uh, valgus deformity, the concave side, or the convex side is on the medial side, so that area is uh, loose, so you fill it up until the ligaments are tight. Why do we fill it up? Because we can't tighten the ligament permanently for the long term, it's stretched, and the collagen fibers are deformed. So we fill up the medial side and on the lateral side we do a lateral compartment release. So this is where I don't want you to get confused. Lateral release, everybody thinks lateral patella release this is not. This is a lateral compartment release and it's the same thing 
as we, we did on the medial side. Number one, in sequence, we release the osteophytes because they can put abnormal tension on your ligaments, so you remove all the ligaments, all the, or the, all the osteophytes, all the way around to the corner to the uh, backside of the uh, knee. And then the capsule complex, to me, is a contiguous structure that includes that anterior lateral ligament. Well, I just look at it as part of a thickening of the capsule, and I release it 1.5 centimeters below the joint line, making sure not to release Gertie's, uh, the iliotibial band on Gertie's tubercle. And that allows that, when you make that sleeve, that allows that bone to open up and correct that deformity. If that's not good enough, then the next step you go is uh, the differential releases, which is iliotibial band and the popliteus. And then lastly, the lateral collateral ligament, which you released off of the uh, lateral uh, epicondyle, which affects both extension and flexion. But that's the sequence. Osteophytes, capsule, both sides, and then on the lateral side, iliotibial band, popliteus, and then lateral collateral ligament. So here's the differential releases. The iliotibial band is tight in extension. Popliteus is tight in flexion, okay? So if you want to release the iliotibial band, so your knee, and you bring it out, and that knee falls into valgus because that iliotibial band is tight, you can release it off of the uh, Gertie's tubercle over here, or you can take a pie crust with your 11-blade scalpel, open it up, and let it stretch out. Conversely, you bend your knee up, and it's pulling back into valgus. You've got to release that popliteus, so you release it right here in this area because it's just underneath the lateral collateral ligament, and you just take your knife or you take a bovie cautery and release a little bit, release a little bit, and you can just see that correction happen. And then lastly, if it's a really bad valgus deformity, sometimes you're gonna have to do a little bit of release of the lateral collateral ligament, a little bit more release of the lateral collateral ligament. And if you release the entire lateral collateral ligament, then you gotta be ready for some type of constraint, okay? What that looks like, you can see the popliteal tendon is in front of that lateral collateral ligament. You can see the lateral capsule in this area, and actually you can see a little hint of that anterior lateral ligament that's trying to uh, show itself uh, apart from the uh, capsule. And always remember, if you're releasing that capsule, you see that little red spot. I took this picture because the lateral genicular artery is in that posterior corner. If you see that little red blush with your tourniquet up, if you let that tourniquet down, that's gonna squirt. So you wanna see, if you see that red blush right there, you wanna cauterize it before you let the tourniquet down, okay? A word on coron extracoronal de uh, deformities. So we talked about our coronal balance, but what happens if you have an extracoronal deformity from a prior fracture, a bowing deformity? The general rule is the closer the extra articular deformity is to the knee, the greater the mechanical malalignment of the knee. So you can see here, if you have a supraconular deformity, it's gonna be a difficult uh, maneuver uh, to correct. So if you have a coronal deformity within the distal one-fourth of the femur or the proximal one-fourth of the tibia, you're going to look at your mechanical alignment, which is from the center of the knee to the center of the head, and you can see that when you make that line perpendicular to the mechanical axis, you're taking that bone cut through your epicondyle and then you're gonna ruin your ligament, and, that and when you're up that high and that femur starts to narrow down, then you're gonna change the size of your femur, you're gonna change your rotation of your femur, and your offset, you may not be able to fit it. So man, that's a problem, and you're doing that for a primary total joint, you're gonna run into big trouble. So when you have these extra articular deformities and you do the extreme releases to correct it, you're gonna sometimes, I mean, more commonly, these ligaments are gonna get released completely off the epicondyle. You're gonna have an unstable knee, and that's not what we want with a primary knee because then you have a constrained knee system in a young patient who's active. It's not gonna last very long. Instead, we think about using, uh, and I always remember this as a quarter rule, when the coronal deformity is within the distal fourth of the proximal femur or within the proximal one-fourth of the proximal tibia, and the deformity is greater than 20 degrees, one-fourth, 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 then you perform an os a concomitant osteotomy of the deformity. So you uh, make a closing wedge osteotomy, a crescentic dome is okay, you correct that deformity, and then you proceed forward with your total knee. How do you do that? You do your osteotomy, 
you correct it, put a plate on and stabilize it with unicortical screws, and then you go through a primary total knee, except that you put a medullary stem through that osteotomy. And preferentially, you want to use a spline tapered stem to give you some rotational deformity or rotational stability of that deformity. Does that make sense? I would rather do an osteotomy and have bone healing than a ligament that's made incompetent. Once you lose the ligament competency, you can't get it back. You can't get it back. Okay. So once you have your coronal deformity corrected, we've made our distal cuts, we've got our joint line restored, we've got our coronal balance done. The last thing that we've got to go through is sagittal plane balance which is balancing the gaps. And for all of us who have gone through the training and you're attending as asked you the questions, okay, what are you gonna do now? You're loose in extension, you're tight in flexion or, or normal. Oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? I went through that myself. It's an intimidating position to be in, especially when you're in the operating room, everybody's looking at you. So I, I made up a mnemonic that I taught many, many years ago and it, and it continues to be used even uh, today. So the reason for extension flexion releases is full extension, full flexion, balancing the gaps, gives you stable knee range from full extension to full flexion without pain. The flexion gap is controlled by the posterior cut of the femur, the tibial cut, as well as the PCL. And you release that PCL, it opens up. Sometimes it opens a little, sometimes it opens up two centimeters. It's a lot, okay? In extension, it's controlled by the distal cut of the femur, proximal tibial cut, and also the uh, posterior capsule. So how are you gonna balance this knee? I mean, you've got six different variables and you've got to do it really quick. So this is a mnemonic and I uh, figured this out over 25 years ago and I still teach it to this day, the rule for OR clarity. And I still go through this every single time when I'm uh, doing a tony. I'm thinking through this mentally. If it's a symmetrical problem, you tinker with the tibia first, and if it's an asymmetrical problem, you tinker with the femur first. How do I remember it? I'm an infection guy, staph. I remember staph. So if you remember your staph bug, this is the rule, STAF. So we're gonna go through every single sagittal plane balance scenario right now. So first, play, first scenario is you made your bone cuts, you're, and you put your trials in, you're tight in extension and you're tight in flexion. Is that a symmetrical or asymmetrical problem? Symmetrical. It's a symmetrical problem. So what are you gonna do first? You're gonna tinker with the tibia. What's the problem? You're tight, so what do you gotta do? You got more bone tibia. So that one is an easy one, right? Now, if you're loose in extension and loose in flexion, what's the problem? Symmetrical or asymmetrical? Symmetrical. symmetrical. So you're gonna tinker with the tibia first, okay? easy. So you add, what are you going to do? How do you get more thickness back? You can add metal or you can add more plastic. Your choice. Okay. So you've made yourself more relaxed in the operating room because you don't have to think about what controls what. It's just a rule. Memorize it. Accept it. However you want to name it. Staff is what I remember. And then we move on. So here we go to the, the more common problems that we have. Tight in extension, so you put your trials in, you're tight in extension, normal in flexion. What's the problem, symmetrical or asymmetrical? So where are you gonna go first? Femur. What's the problem with the femur? It's tight. So where are you gonna address it? You're gonna address it on the distal femur. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna release either the contracture in the back of the knee or remove the distal bone. Great, so always attack the femur. So what do we do with the femur? The first thing you can do is you release the posterior capsule right here, let it stretch out, correct your contracture. So femur. Second option is you can cut more distal femur right here and that corrects it. So if you don't want to go to the back of the knee, I understand that, back of the knee, arteries, nerves, all that stuff. All right, cut a little bit more bone. Okay, so what's the rule there? The Ranawat rule, Chit Ranawat. His parents are in indoor. He comes out to rock every single year. The rule is this, best rule I've ever le uh, learned was two millimeters of bone resection in equals 10 degrees of correction, of contracture. And it works, it's right on the money. Chit was exactly right with that. All right, remember this, if you're gonna do the posterior soft tissue releases and you're gonna go release the posterior capsule, the sequence is the same thing. Get rid of all your osteophytes first, 
Number two, release the posterior capsule. Number three, if you really want to do it, and I've done it before, but it's kind of scary, you go all the way and release the gastroc tendon insertions on the femur with a, with a osteotome or elevator, but you're way up there. And always do your posterior releases in flexion, as Chris was, uh, and others were talking about today. The artery is really close. Uh, to the back of the knee and it falls back up to 1.2 centimeters at 90 degrees of flexion. So posterior releases are performed with the knee flexed always, minimum of 90 degrees of flexion. Popteal artery is located behind the capsule at the tibial PCL insertion. That's more odd. You find that PCL site, it's right behind it, okay? So this is what it looks like in the operating room. Those are my, osteo I have an osteotome back behind the knee, so it corrects the contracture, clears out that space for flexion. Next scenario is this, normal extension, tight inflection. What's the problem? Asymmetrical. Where are you gonna address it? At the femur. Where are you gonna go on the femur? What's the problem? It's inflection, so somewhere posteriorly you gotta do it. First rule, always make sure you have a normal posterior slope. Okay, so if that no posterior slope is okay, you remove the posterior femur, remove that posterior bone, go to a smaller size implant, or if you have a cruciate retaining knee, again, still on the femur, you can recess the PCL. Those are your two options. But number one, knee reflux. Always check the posterior slope, because if you have an anterior slope, the knee will not bend uphill. You have to have an, either a neutral slope or a posterior slope. Preferentially, not too much of a posterior slope, more towards uh, six degrees, okay? So tight inflection, first option. Uh, this gap is too full. You uh, didn't make enough cut, so you remove uh, a little bit of bone, and that takes care of the problem. Or if you have a cruciate retaining knee and, re and you retain the posterior cruciate ligament and it's tight, sometimes the PCL is contracted, this is what we call the liftoff sign. You put your trials in and you see that tibial insert lift up like that, that automatically tells you your flexion gap is tight. That is a, that's the, what we call the, the liftoff sign. If you have a liftoff sign, you're tight. And if you push it really hard, oh, it's better, it's still gonna be a painful total knee. So how do you release that PCL? Just like we do with other orthoplasty uh, parts of the knee, we use a bovi. okay? So here we take the bovi. You can see the lift off on the left, a little bit of uh, on that medial side uh, on the PCI, we release it just a little bit and it comes down and then you release it just enough so it comes flat and then you're balanced. Okay, so those are your two options. Now the more fun parts of this is your normal extension, your loose inflection, what's the problem? Symmetrical or asymmetrical? And so where you're gonna attack it on the femur, what's abnormal? Flexion, what are you gonna do with flexion? Hey, see, it's not so hard, is it, right? So this is how you learn this rule and then it makes, it makes knee arthroplasty fun. And then I can take you guys away from that sports medicine and do more, <laughs> more, more arthroplasty, right? So uh, what are you going to do? You increase the size of the femur. How are you going to uh, increase the size of the femur? Number four, please. So you take three off, put number four on. You've got a little gap there. You fill it up with a little bit of cement or a little piece of metal. You're, you're good to go, okay? So the other way you can do this is you can translate the femur. So you've opened up a size three and you don't want to throw it away because it costs money, right? So you can translate it down. So let's go through that. So on the left, you, uh, your flushing gap is loose. And so you can go to the larger femoral component that you see there on the right and fill it in with cement or an augmentation or a screw, whatever you want to. Or if you don't want to get rid of that femur that you just opened that cost uh, uh, a lot of money, you can take this and just shift it down. You can make a little bit of a notch on the top and you just shift it down and then fill that up with cement, okay? And fill it up in that area right there. So this is where it gets a little bit more fun is I've always told you the asymmetrical problems, you, uh, you tackle the femur first. So here you are normal in extension, loose in flexion, you know, asymmetrical problem. Well, what you can do because you're loose, you can fill it up. So you're loose in flexion, you can add the flexion gap, you can add more tibia, 
fill up the flexion gap, but when you bring it out in extension, you're going to be tight, right? And that's called a two-step solution. You fill up the loose flexion gap with more plastic, bring it out in an extension, and then readdress it as a tight extension gap. Why would you want to do that? Because it's easier sometimes. Not every case is, uh, is you need to do it, but this tape, for example, you have a, uh, a knee, your loose inflection, you add, you go from 12 millimeters to 16 millimeters, you bring it out, and you have a flexion contracture. If you're really comfortable with going to the back of the knee, you take out the insert, lift it up, release the posterior capsule, comes out straight, then you don't have to do any more, more metal work, you can just release it. So it, for some, that's an easier way to go. Just remember the two-step solution only applies when you have an asymmetrical loose. You can't, there's no way to deal with that with an asymmetrical tight. So asymmetrical loose, okay? So that's the exception to the uh, asymmetrical rule. So now we'll go loose in extension, normal in flexion. What's the problem? Asymmetrical. Where's the problem now? The problem is loose in extension. So what do you got to do? Add more femur, okay. So you bring the femoral component uh, distal, so you've cut too much, so you gotta bring it back down. So what's that look like? Here you are, you're in hyperextension. You need to fill in that gap, so you bring that femoral component down. How you bring it distally? Put some screws in, fill it up with cement. If you want to, you open up some augs. If you're really worried that it's gonna tilt off a little bit, sure, you put a little stem on it, and that takes care of your problem. Make sense? Or, you can go do the two steps. So here you are. You can say, well, I'm loose in hyper, I'm loose in extension. I add more tibia. I get it out straight, but when I bend the knee, it's tight. So it's a tight flexion gap. Now, why would I do a two step? So if I'm doing a cruciate retaining knee, I added tibia, and I know that when I bend it down into flexion, I have a lift off. All I do is take a bovi, release it, done. So in those in those scenarios. It's just an easy way to go. So those are the steps of what I think through every single case that I do. If you understand that rule, memorize that rule and understand the differential releases, then knee arthroplasty is fun. And you don't have to be intimidated about it. And you shouldn't. Because if you can do all those sophisticated sports surgery procedures, and I'm not being ironic, those, some of those cases you do are very good. Then for me, for you to take a bovie and do a little release here and release there, arthroplasty makes it fun, okay? So a little bit of uh, technique and total knee. Thus far, and this has been controversial, there's no difference in aseptic loosening or revision at midterm follow, which is six to seven, six to eight years, with standard instrumentation, which I showed you, the medullary guides and all that, compared to navigated total knee, robotic assisted total knee, and patient specific instruments. So you'll hear some lectures tomorrow and on Sunday about all of those different techniques, that, but this, thus far, there's been nothing superior that we know of, and we've got to wait for those longer term follow ups to, to, uh, uh, to come through that. Next thing I want to talk about is transexamic acid. We use it a lot uh, over in North America. Remember that when you do surgery with a bovie cautery or a knife, you're going to cut those vessels and you start the clotting cascade, which makes a fibrin clot, which seals those open holes. And if you have those open holes filled up and then they heal, then you've got to take that clot and break it down. The problem is if you break down that clot too fast and you have blood loss, postoperatively you have a hematoma. So what do we got to do to cut down hematoma formation is we break down or we slow down that fibrinolysis that controls the clot size and, and then activates the healing a little bit sooner. So remember that plasmin breaks down the fibrin clot, creating fibrin split products, but it also creates the D-dimer. So why do we use transexamic acid? Because it slows down that fibrinolysis so the clot stays on longer so you don't leak and ooze into the joint creating a hematoma. And what I want you to know about transexamic acid is it's a lysine analog. There's about four or five sites on the plasminogen that it attaches and stops that conversion to plasmin which breaks down your clot. Half-life is three hours, excretion is renal. So uh, there's been, it's a relatively safe chemical to use. So the important thing that we have learned uh, from our trials is that there's no increased re rate of venous thrombo thromboembolic disease 
with a history of thrombobulgic disease. So if you have a history of blood clots, it is still safe to use trianxamic acid. If you have a history of a stroke or a heart attack, there is no increased risk of cardiovascular events when using trianxamic acid. The two main contraindications for using trianxamic acid is known anaphylaxis to it. And also remember seizure disorders because if you have a seizure disorder, lysine analogs compete with the glycine receptors in the brain which dis cause disinhibition, disinhibition and you can get a seizure with it. So if you have someone with a seizure disorder, don't use trinexamic acid. Now that's the one thing I've learned when I've given uh, on these lectures. Next thing is perioperative nerve blocks. We want our patients happy after surgery, and I will freely admit when I use a saw and cut bone, it hurts a lot more than uh, doing those ligament reconstructions. I will tell you that. So what we want to do is reduce the acute perioperative pain, which allows early mobilization. If you mobilize earlier, then you get less blood clots. Patients don't have problems with pneumonia. The two common blocks that we use perioperatively are the femoral nerve block, and then we've gravitated towards the adductor canal block, which is further down the leg. So the femoral nerve block is in the groin. Uh, it is, when you block it up proximally, you're going to have motor, uh, motor blockade. So the sensory block is to the medial side of the knee and to the anterior knee, and the posterior knee is not covered. So when you do a femoral nerve block and in the uh, recovery room or in the floor, is it the back of my knee hurts, it's like, oh man, this person has a blood clot. No, you just don't have blocked the back of the knee. So just remember when you do a femoral nerve block, it doesn't block all the way around the knee. It's only on that medial side, a little bit anterior. So the area of sensory block always goes all the way from the thigh, all the way down to that lower foot. There will be no active knee extension. So if you do a femoral nerve block and you ask your patient to walk, they're going to buckle, they're going to fall, and they're going to split your arthrotomy open, and it's a disaster. And I've had that happen to me a couple times to the point that we say, no more femoral nerve blocks. So how can you get a sensory block without a block in the femoral nerve? You just move down to the adductor canal distally because most of the motor nerves are up proximally and the sensory portion of that, of that nerve is more distal. So you go to the adductor block, which is a sensory block only. Again, it still blocks the medial and anterior side of the knee and postoperatively, you're still going to have pain posteriorly and on the lateral side. So it's not a, you're not completely blocking that knee, and you need to know that. And if you wake up with knee pain in the back of the knee, that's just part of the postoperative procedure of uh, doing your, your surgery. So the adductor nerve block is in the thigh. It's sensory block only. Remember this, that there's equivalent pain relief to a femoral nerve block. So it's just as good. Single injections are just as good as an indwelling catheter, and the problems with indwelling catheters, once you get them out of bed, that catheter moves, it dislodges, it's no good, okay? The adductor canal block is additive to the periarticular block. Remember that the, the block is only on the medial side of the knee, so you block mainly the sensory nerves, and you also block the, the nerve to the vastus, uh, vastus medialis as well. So this is what it looks like. Here's all the nerve innervation to the knee. You can see that a saphenous nerve block, whether it's up high in the groin or down in the adductor canal, blocks that medial side of the knee and a little bit of anterior and a little bit of posteriorly, but that lateral side is not covered. So the articular innervation has multiple sources. The capsular injections from the inside of the knee are hard because it's hard to get all the way around, but I still do that as well. So peripheral nerve blocks must not also, remember, not impair motor function because then the patient is going to fall. So looking at it, taking this all to together, how are we going to block the back of the knee so you feel better about it or your patient feels better is a, what we call an IPAC block. IPAC stands for infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee. So an, an, an anesthesiologist can take a needle and go find the artery and inject the, the back of the knee, or if you have the flexion gap open with laminar spreaders, you can just take that capsule and inject it with, uh, from inside. So I tend to inject it from inside, but it's just as good as if you have your anesthesiologist do it. And why is it nice to have your anesthesiologist do it? Because you take that away and you save time in the OR and you have your anesthesiologist do it from uh, preoperatively, and then the, the patients are happy. 
So the nerves blocked with an IPAC are the terminal sensory fibers of the sciatic nerve. The best perioperative relief, if you look at the studies, is an adductor canal block and an IPAC block together. And some will say that you do an IPAC block to get the back of the knee, the adductor canal block to get the medial knee, and then you inject on that lateral capsule where you can see it and you get all three together. But that hasn't proven statistics because, statistically significant because that's a hard study to do to do all three together. So I like to use the perioperative or capsular blocks on the lateral side of the knee, IPAC block, and an adductor canal block. And those patients will be very satisfied for those first uh, 48 to 72 hours. And after that time, the pain starts to subside. You have your anti-inflammatory pills. Try to avoid the narcotics as, as, as much as possible. With that, I know our time is short, and this is uh, what the IPAC does. It covers the back of that knee, and the adductor canal uh, block blocks that medial side of that knee. So with that, I will stop right there. And again, I know this has been a hard day for you. It's been nonstop, but if you see us in a hole, stop us. We'll answer all your questions. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.